one second. Yeah, Pastor, if you could kindly start with a word of prayer, we can pray and start. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, creator of the whole universe of God, we come before you with humble hearts for giving us this wonderful opportunity, Father, to come together and study your words. And we thank you, God, for keeping us alive and keeping our breath going up and down the throat. It's all in your hands, O oh God. And if you want, you can choke it. If you want, you can keep it running, O oh God. And you definitely choose to keep us alive. We are so very much grateful to you for your grace and for your mercy, Lord, and also for all your provision in every area of our lives. We enjoy good health, O oh God, and that is also because of you. And some who do not will know, Father, that there is a purpose, a plan, and I pray, Lord, that you would work out your plan and your purpose, even through the adversities of God. And I pray that you would heal them, God, and bring them back to the normal health, O oh Father. But we just commit all of them in your mighty and powerful hand this morning. And we thank you again for this wonderful time of uh, studying your words together. And I pray, God, that you would help us to keep our eyes and our minds, our whole being open to you. Lord, we just uh, keep our antennas tuned to you, oh God, so that we will listen to your voice, oh Father, and we will obey your voice in our lives, no matter what. And that will, Lord, glorify your name. And to that end, we commit ourselves in your hands. And I also want to thank you for Brother Pastor Mano and granting him, Lord, this heart to work on this text, oh God, and I'm very sure you have given him a lot of meat to share uh, today. And so I pray, Lord, as you share through him, he will be blessed and we will be blessed and through us many will be blessed, oh Father, and that where your name will be blessed to God and be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor, for the beautiful prayer. Uh, for those of you paying attention, Pastor prayed. Our life is in his hand, in God's hand, and he can choke it or he can keep it running. And reminded me from Psalm 90, where it says, teach us to number our days for the days are evil. And it's not about counting the days, but making our days count and investing our time and our effort, our sweat and blood and what is necessary to be in the kingdom business is what this is all about. So, um, you know, which is the thing that matters when Christ can then tell us when we meet him and see him face to face, well done, my good and faithful servant. So let's not grow weary of good doing, but continue to strive and fight the good fight of faith and keep the faith. So thank you, Pastor, for that our life is in God's hand for that reminder. So welcome to Milk to Meet. It is January 30th, 2022, Anna Domini. Uh, today's session, we'll continue to look at the book of Deuteronomy and we'll learn some great truth from it. Uh, today's session is actually called The Accursed One, and um, we'll expand on that text uh, as well. Psalmist in Psalm 37, 21 to 23 actually writes and he says, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. And the word wicked over here is rasha, which means an offender or a criminal, evil, or it could also mean the evil one. Like, for example, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray or the disciples' prayer that the Lord taught us to pray, we say, keep us from the evil or keep us from evil. It actually would render properly to say, keep us from the evil one, the devil himself and his schemes. Uh, and then the word righteous over there is actually sad which means blameless the one who is right or the righteous one so this could render that the evil one borrows and does not pay back could mean that life that we have been given which was is actually borrowed by the evil one since the day of our conception for in sin now we conceived and it's not given back the righteous one jesus christ however shows mercy and gives us grace so that we are no longer under bondage and all who have believed in the lord jesus christ are blessed by him if you notice it says those who are blessed of him in christ of christ shall inherit the earth and those who are accursed of him shall be cut off meaning being separated from the very inheritance of the lord um, those who don't accept the lord jesus christ hold on to the thought and we'll expand on that more in our study today we've been studying the threefold card in scripture the kingdom card the covenant card and the salvation card that runs from the very first letter in the book of uh, genesis to the last letter in the book of 
of uh, Revelation, and we've been looking at different covenants, the Edenic, the Noahic, the Mo Abrahamic, and then now we've been studying the Mosaic covenant. We'll be looking at the Davidic and the new, new covenant in Christ Jesus. And it's been amazing that God's been leading us through as we've been looking at God's contractual relationship of love with us, and we ought to love him for he first loved us, so that we show him the, the, the word that we worship him as he's a great king, being the king over all kings and the Lord over all lords. And we see that great king in Christ Jesus and the salvation that he brings unto us because he loved us and gave us that unconditional love for us to be part of his family. So we, that's the focus and the context. We've been studying the Mosaic Covenant and we've been going through the, the, the books of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible of the canon that has been given unto us. And we're now in the last book and last week in Deuteronomy chapter 18, we looked at the symbolic reference or the Christological significance of the greatest prophet that Moses will prophesy. And so we see God made a covenant of law with the people of Israel. As a recap from last week's study at Mount Horeb through Moses, God's servant, which was a conditional covenant, which was bilateral, unlike the unconditional unilateral covenant that he made of love with a uh, covenant of love that he made with his forefathers. Uh, of the forefathers, um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God promised through Moses that God would raise a prophet from among the people who will be like him and they must listen to whom they must listen and heed to. And God said that he would put his words in the mouth of this prophet who shall be raised and he shall speak all that God commands him to. Whoever does not hearken and listen to the word of God spoken to this prophet shall be required to give an account of their unbelief in God and his word. And the servant does not have the right, as we learned as today, uh, last week, that the servant does not have the right to the heirship, but the son does. So the law cannot save. Uh, Moses was symbolic of the law. The servant of God, faithful in the house of the Lord, could not save. But the Lord Jesus, the son of God, can. And Jesus is the prophet like Moses, who was raised by God, resurrected from the dead to live forever. God has spoken to us in the past in diverse manners, in sundry times through the prophets, and now in these last days since the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ has spoken to us by his son as we read in the book of Hebrews. And G uh, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, and G Jesus is the word of God who became flesh, dwelt among men, and in him is the fullness of the glory of God. John chapter 1, we read that as well. And Jesus is the son of God, Whoever heeds the words of Jesus and believes in him shall become the family of God, and whoever does not must give an account of their unbelief and be cut off from the family of God. And that's a warning and a counsel with the invitation that is given that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, for there is no other means to salvation other than by the Lord Jesus Christ because of the work of the cross and because of the work of redemption that he displayed on the cross. Um, last week, we learned about the symbolic reference to Christ. This week, we'll actually continue to look at another typological reference to Christ Jesus from the few verses that we're going to read. It's about six verses we'll read, but there is so much packed in there. So the pericope actually can be broken into two major sections. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18 to 21 talks about the rebellious son. And Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 to 23 talks about the accursed one. And actually, let's go ahead and read through that text with the, you know, with the main idea that is given, and then we'll expand into the most the Christological significance of these texts itself. So, so with that said, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18 to 21, if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold of him and bring him out unto the elders of a city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of a city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of a city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shall thou put evil away from among you and all Israel shall hear and fear. And if a man has committed a sin worthy of death and he to be he be to be put to death and thou shalt hang him on a tree his body shall not remain all night upon the tree but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day for he that is hanged on a tree is accursed of god that thy land that thy land be not defiled which the lord thy god gives thee for thy inheritance the main idea over here and we'll expand on this text quite quite extensively is a stubborn and a rebellious son is brought to the elders of the son city to the gate where justice can be rendered and both father and mother have to witness that of the son's rebellion and he shall be stoned to death. Why? So that evil is put away and this will be an example for all of Israel to hear and fear the Lord. The second part of that text over here is if a person, if a person has committed a sin or a crime 
that is guilty of death, death, then that person shall be hanged as a public spectacle for the people to, of the land to see. That person is declared or deemed to be cursed of God, but the law also mandates that before the day is over, the accursed one is to be buried so that there is no defilement of the land. It's pretty straightforward in the text in terms of a law that is given in the, in the Torah uh, you know, to the people of Israel. But we need to seek and we seek the Holy Spirit's guidance to reveal the truth in the truth that is revealed. And so let's pray that the Holy Spirit leads us from the milk to the meat of the substance in this text that is given unto us. So let's look at each of the text, each of the verses a little bit more in detail. It says 21 verse 18, it says Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse 18, if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them. What comes to mind? So if you can unmute and what comes to mind when you hear the word stubborn and rebellious? Thoughts? If you're speaking, you're, not, you're on mute. So stubborn and rebellious. What picture or thing? Prodigal comes son. Prodigal son. Okay, beautiful. Actually, it's excellent. We'll talk about that. Thanks. What else comes to mind from a doing something bad? It's more like defiance. You know, I mean, defiance. Okay. Israel. Israel comes to mind. Okay. Beautiful. Us. 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 Okay. We come to mind. Very nice. Thanks. Samson. Samson. Okay. Bobby or Dinesh. Was it Bobby or Dinesh? Brothers. Dinesh. 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 <laughs> They sound the same. So, so the English meaning of this word stubborn actually does not do much justice to the intended meaning in the context that it is written and inspired. The Hebrew actually reads, he ye le is ben sorer u more. If has a man, a son stubborn and rebellious. The word sorer actually comes from the root word sarar, meaning a rebel and actually more appropriately backsliding to go against the direction that has been commanded. The word more is, comes from actually from the root word mara, meaning to embitter. That's why we hear water, waters of mara or uh, Naomi referred to herself as, don't no longer call me Naomi, which means pleasant, but call me mara for I am embittered, meaning embittering, provoking or disobedient. Moses actually uses the word uh, rebel or morem, meaning to say that you were embittering and provoking for the people of Israel who wanted to backslide and go back to Egypt, their land of bondage. And we read that in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 7, where it says, Remember and forgot not how you provoked the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that you did depart from of the land of Egypt, from the day you departed until you've come into this place right across the Jordan before you enter into your promised land, you have been rebellious against the Lord. You've been embittering the Lord, provoking the Lord. And interestingly, God uses the same kind of word to describe Moses and Aaron themselves, where he says, Meratim is the word for rebel of rebel rebellion of Moses, which comes again from the word root word Mara to embitter the, Lord, embitter the Lord. So the law and the priesthood that God had given to be symbolic of the coming of Christ was embittering of the Lord. Numbers chapter 27, verse 13 and 14, we see that. And when thou hast seen this, thou shalt be gathered unto thy people as Aaron, thy brother was gathered, that you will die, you will not enter into the land. For you rebelled against my commandment in the desert of Zin, in the waters of <clears throat> Meribah in Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin. And as Sangeeta pointed out, the New Testament reference that re relates aptly to the stubborn and rebellious account of the son is the account of the prodigal son that we see in Luke chapter 15, 11 to 32. Now, interestingly, keep that in mind in terms of going back as part of stubborn and rebellious. Who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother? And the word Hebrew word over here is shama, and it actually has to do more with the meaning of the, or implying the meaning of heeding, meaning that there is some action that is taken to the voice or the words that have been given or heard. So it's not just hearing the word of God, but it's actually obeying, meaning to say to heed or do what that means. And so an example of this, of God's requirement in terms of obedience by action on the words that God has given is a beautiful account in 1 Samuel chapter 15 that we read from 16 to 25, where Saul actually spares the king Agag 
Agag, the Amalek, Amalekite king, and Samuel had told Saul that you shall, the words of God saying that you shall destroy all of the Amalekites, but Saul does not. And so the word of God comes to Saul again through Samuel. And if you read from 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 16 onwards, it says, then Samuel said unto Saul, stay, I will tell thee what the Lord has stayed, said to me this night. And he said unto him, say on. And Samuel said, when you were little in your own sight, was it not that I made you the head of the tribes of Israel and the Lord appoint, anointed you to be king over Israel? I took you from nothing and put you to be the highest ruler in the king of Israel. And the Lord sent you on a journey, go and utterly destroy the sinners of uh, uh, the Amalekites and fight against them until they are consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but did fly upon thy spoil, meaning you took the plunder of the land and did evil in the sight of the Lord. To disobey is to be doing evil. Note, not doing what God's saying to do, in essence, is doing evil or doing things against the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, A, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone thy way, which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalek. Now Saul actually lies to cover up his disobedience. The application is, sin will beget more sin. The only way to get out of this entanglement of sin is by confession, for by confession of the Lord Jesus Christ as Christ and Savior of the world, and our sins to him, God is faithful to, and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness is what the scripture teaches us. And then he says, but Saul responds and he says, but the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord, to, to a sacrifice unto the, the, the Lord thy God in, in Gilgal. Notice over there, Saul is not only responsible as the leader of the people, but he now shifts blame to the people. Thing that we need to keep in mind that we are responsible for those we, are, we have authority over. But it is the same behavior that was seen in the garden when disobedience of not heeding and obeying to the voice of God led man who was supposed to be the leader of his household shift blame onto the woman and the woman shift blame onto the servant, a serpent. Sin not only begets sin, but it also, it sins shifts blame. And so we've got to be careful. And he tries to rationalize and he says, and you know, I actually, the people took the spoil so that they can sacrifice to the Lord. And Samuel said, has not the Lord, has the Lord great, as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Then he makes some powerful statements about rebellion and of sin. And he says, for rebellion is the sin of witchcraft or divination and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Meaning to say a stubborn and a rebellious sin is one who is not depending on the divine one, but instead on divination, like the sin of witchcraft. And the stubbornness is like having other gods before you, making idols and hearkening unto those words, for it is as iniquity and idolatry is what the scripture says. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. And so in essence, disobedience is in essence a rejection of the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. And... Now, therefore, I pray you pardon my sin and turn again with me that I might worship the Lord. So it's interesting that we have, I wanted to spend time there because we just want, just want, just want, don't want to think of stubbornness and rebellious as just something too light or trite. It's more important for us to recognize that the root of it is rejecting the Lord. It's actually as bad as depending on our own strengths, not on him. And we are, in fact, backsliding into the world of bondage as opposed to going in the direction that God is pointing us to. And then the word continues to say, and when they have chastened him, will, you know, to, to, he will not hearken unto them. To understand the meaning of this, what is does not hearkening to the voice of the parent after the son has been chastened, we've got to turn to actually Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 to 8. And it says there, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Chastening over here is not actually, you know, 
corrective action as an abuse. It's actually corrective action, but not as in abuse or hurting, but it is corrective action as in discipline. Like a coach would make the athlete run multiple times in multiple labs or box multiple times so that the athlete will be able to run the race and win the prize. That's the chastening that all that the trials and the tribulations we have in life today is given unto us so that it will build that character through that perseverance and it will be the very character of God that will emerge from us as we see in the book of James. But then he goes on in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8, a powerful verse where he says, but if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not son. God chastens whom he loves. God chastens his children as a loving father, corrects a backsliding, a backsliding and a rebellious son. So to still not hearken to the voice of God after his chastening is to, in essence, severe the very relationship with the parents, with the Lord, and to reject the sonship that we have, making one an illegitimate person. So the question there is, it's important for us to recognize that we are not stubborn, rebellious, and after the chastisement of the Lord, we don't actually continue to live in our evil ways. Question then, who is the son? I think we talked about that in the picture. Who is the son that this is referring to? By context, it is Israel. By extension, it is you and me. Exodus chapter 4 verse 22 says, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Hosea chapter 11 verse 1, it says, When Israel was a child, I, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. And by in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, it talks about us who are believed in the Lord Jesus Christ to be the sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear, even though it doesn't appear that we should, of what we shall be like, but we know that when he will appear, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. So question is, are you a son or a daughter of God? If you are, what kind of a son are you? After you've been redeemed out of spiritual slavery, are you backsliding, being stubborn and rebellious, being disobedient, rejecting the very sonship uh, relationship that you have with God, making ourselves then illegitimate? Or are we hearing and hearkening and heeding to the voice of God? A question that you and I have to answer tonight before we go to sleep. What kind of a son or a daughter are you? Now, let's go on to the next verse, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 19, then shall, he, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of a city and unto his place. In literal sense over here, both the father and mother have to be in unison of thought to bring the stubborn and rebellious son. This is in essence a control because the father and the mother have to be in unison of thought, a kind of control against child abuse from a literal context. The need also for two witnesses before judgment can be rendered is, is, is established over here. And we'll see how they will bring two false witnesses to actually you know, uh, render justice, in fact, injustice to the very Lord Jesus Christ himself in the account of his, in the account of his trial and crucifixion. The need for two witnesses laid, then they shall lay hold of him, meaning take hold of him and bring him out to the elders, the ones who are supposed to be aged and wise in the, you know, to render justice, true justice. And note the words over here, his city, his place, implying that the justice will be rendered in the place where the people know of this person and hold not hold on to that thought. Because you know, when Christ visits Jerusalem, he will cry over them because they would not know of his visitation. And he will establish in, the, in, in his, in his uh, discourse there in Matthew that Jerusalem is his city, as we'll read in a, in a couple of minutes. So the main point over here is though going, you know, going from, again, the milk to the meat part of it in substance, his father and his mother. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8 says, My son, hear the instructions of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Instruction over here is the Hebrew word musar, meaning chastisement or discipline. So hear the discipline of thy father, the and the, not the law of the, and and forsake not the law of thy mother. And the word law over there is Torah, meaning as pointing, guiding, like a finger pointing the way or the direction. So over here, the word actually talks about the discipline of the father and the direction of the mother, which is what we ought to hear and heed. And in this context, it talks about you know God the Father. And then the law of the mother. Now, here's an interesting thought. <clears throat> what image comes to mind when you think of Moses? 
what are some of the things that come to mind? All right, I'm waiting. <laughs> the Ten Commandments, receiving the Ten Commandments from receiving the Lord. Receiving the Ten the Commandments, people. okay. Thank you, Suja. What else? Parting the Red Sea. Parting the Red Sea. Okay, these are events about the person Moses. I'll Old give you an example. A lawgiver. Oh, okay. The one who was trying to run away and then obeyed God. Okay, all right. Uh, run mostly away. He, he's a liberator. Liberator or a deliverer, he's a leader, a prophet. By gender, would you ever think of Moses as a mother? Or have you thought of Moses as a mother? It's interesting thought. No. And, and say that again. I said no. No, right? So we don't think of Moses as a mother. Numbers chapter 11, verse 12, actually, the children of Israel come to Moses and they complain. And Moses then turns to God and he says, did I conceive all these people? Did I bear them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse, carries an in infant to the land that you promised an oath to our fathers? So while some mistakenly actually think that Moses is the mother or that the law is metaphorically symbolic of being the mother, close scrutiny actually of the text reveals to us that Moses is asking or questioning God and by way of his questioning, he's actually establishing a crucial critical truth that God in fact is the one who is the mother of Israel and that it was not Moses who conceived all the people, it was not he who bore them, it was not that he would carry and nurture them after birth as a nurse carries. So what the text there then implies is the father and mother, and we know very clearly from the from scriptural text that God is father because Jesus refers to God as your father. Matthew chapter 6 verse 1 and Matthew chapter 7 verse 11 says your father in heaven and Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 says our father in heaven bringing us in to be co-heirs or brothers and sisters of Christ himself. And that's powerful, not difficult for us to accept that fact that God is father. But God is mother is a little more difficult to accept because we're not used to that kind of thinking. And this is not a feminist egalitarian viewpoint as much as it is to show the goodness, the care and the love and of God as a mother. In fact, Jesus himself says of that in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, where he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kills the prophets and stones them which are sent unto you, how often would I have gathered gathered my children together, even as a hen, feminine, gathers her, feminine, chickens under her, feminine, wings, and you would not. Even as a hen gathers a chicken under her wing. The Christological significance of this is in Acts chapter 2, we read verse 22 to 24, ye men of Israel hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourself also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, the father and mother, you have, that's the text that I'm implying over there, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God has raised up. God shall raise up a prophet and God is raised up from the dead, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it or by death. God as father and mother by determinate counsel was the one who brought his son Jesus to be judged. The key difference over here, however, we need to recognize is that Jesus was not a rebellious son, but the righteous son approved by God, given for the rebellious son, Israel, and for us. It was our rebellion that led him to be judged. It was God's determinate counsel, and by wicked hands of men, God's plan of salvation tomb of mankind came to be, which brings me actually to my next point, which says, and they shall lay hold of him and bring him out. Matthew chapter 26, verse 56 to 57. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And they that had laid hold on Jesus, led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. The rebellious son shall be brought to the elders of the city by being laid hold of him. And God is the one who brought him over so that we can be saved. Otherwise, rightfully, it would have been you and me that would have been had to be brought to the elders of the city and we would have been judged to be put to death. 
amazing picture of grace over here. And so it says the scripture is fulfilled in them that they laid hold of Jesus' wicked hands of men used to lead him away to Caiaphas into the place. And then it says he shall be brought to his city and to the gate of his place. And Hebrews chapter 12, 13 verse 12 actually says, wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate the city of David where Jesus Christ came was born in Bethlehem. We read that in Luke chapter 2, verse 4, 4 and 11. The city of Jesus that we hear about, where is, what is the city of Jesus actually? If I was to ask you, what is the city where, where Jesus would say that he was a resident of? Any thoughts? Nazareth. Okay, he was raised in the city of Nazareth. Good point. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, okay. Any other thoughts? Jesus actually said in Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the son of man does not have a place to lay his head. Technically, Jesus did not have a city. He does refer to Jerusalem where he was judged by the chief priests and the elders as that being the city of a great king. Matthew chapter 5, verse 34 to 35 establishes that. And it says, you know, you shall not swear by heaven nor by earth, which is God's throne, nor by earth, which is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. A veiled reference to the kingship of Jesus as he walked in, as he, as he rode in on, the, on, on, a, on a colt, saying that he was the king, the Messiah was coming to be, but they did not know of his visitation. In the trial of Jesus before the people and the place of the judgment that was passed on him to be crucified, the law of being brought to one's own city within the great gate itself was broken. They had to break the law to actually crucify the one who gave the law. Amazing picture of how God has been working and in control of all situations. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 20, the next verse it says, and they shall say unto the elders of a city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. The witness that is given over there by the very parents and with no deliberation there is that this person is in all eating and drinking matters of life. He is a backslider and a rebel, not following what ought to be. As I established the rebellious son, is brought for judgment. Jesus Christ, the righteous son, was brought for judgment because the rebels that we are in matters of life are constantly backsliding and rebelling against the Lord God. The Christological significance again over here, as in the fulfillment of the scripture, is that the witness of the people who did not believe in Jesus Christ as the great king actually came back and they said that he was a glutton and a drunkard. If you actually look at the, uh, the text in Matthew chapter 11, verse 19 to 20, it says, the son of man came eating and drinking and they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber, meaning a drunkard, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Then began he to denounce or to upbraid the cities wherein in most of his mighty works were done because they did not repent. From that text I read, while they alleged and accused Christ of being a drunkard and a glutton, praise be to God our Father that that text over there says, and I see the goodness and the grace of God that he is a friend of sinners. And that means he's accessible to me. And that means as chief of sinner that I am, he's accessible to me. He's accessible to you as well if you are a sinner. That's a question that only you can answer if you are a sinner. Jesus will have no shame hanging out with you and me. For he despised the shame that was before him and he hung on the cross for you and me. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is now seated at the, good, at the right hand of God, in the right hand of the throne of God. Amazing picture of Christ. He became naked on the cross so that we can be clothed with his righteousness and not be shamed of being naked. But he hangs out with us, a friend of sinners, of whom, of whom I am chief, is what I would say. That's a personal declaration, and I thank God for that. It continues on to say in verse 21, and all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he dies so that you shall put evil away from among you and all Israel shall hear. The, specif the specifics of how to kill this rebellious son is given here saying that the rebellious son is to be stoned to death. But what is more important for us to recognize is the execution of the stubborn and rebellious son is for the reason that God's, God gives, which is to put evil away from among you. Israel shall hear and fear the Lord God is the other reason that he gives. 
So a son who after chastisement has remained in his disobedience, backsliding and rebellion remains in evil and in the promised land, the principle here is in the promised land there shall be no room for evil. The wages of sin is death and death is the means by which evil is put out, put to an end. And that Israel will hear and fear. They will hear of the holiness of God that is revealed by the law of God. Romans chapter 7 verse 12. For the law is perfect, holy and just. Because it talks about the Lord, the law, the law giver himself. And whoever, it's a school, matters, school master to teach us about who Christ is. And whoever remains in evil, despite God's chastening, can expect nothing but to be separated from him for holiness and unholiness cannot coexist. So it's a stark warning that the, you know, that the, the, you shall put them to death and you shall put evil away and all Israel shall hear and fear. Let's continue on with the next two verses that are there in that text. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death and, has, and he be to be put to death and thou hang him on a tree. In this text, in this verse, there are two main points. One is that you are worthy of death, and the second is to hang him on a tree. What the sin is, is not mentioned over here. But the text simply says that if one commits a sin that is worthy of death, he is to be put to death. Again, a person is to be put to death. How he is put to death is not mentioned. Is it by stoning or some other means? We do not. But if that person is put to death and then hung on a tree, then there are some conditions to be followed. But before we get to those conditions, who is worthy of death? And in order to ask that question, what is death? What is death? Thoughts? Thoughts. Separation. Separation, beautiful. Brother Shrini. Physically, it is the cessation of life. Spiritually, since man was created a spiritual being, and was made in the image of God as a living soul. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. It aligns with what Brother Srini was saying. Death in the truest sense would be separated from the very breath of God. The Holy Spirit of God who is the only source of eternal life. And so the question is important for us. We will die, yes, physically. But will we die spiritually? Being separated from God. Physical and spiritual aspects. Every man will die physically. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26, 27 establishes it's appointed unto man that they must die once and then enter into judgment. That judgment will decide if you're going to be separated or you're going to be actually in sync and in the presence of God, inheriting the promised land. It's important for us to recognize that. The second question I have is what are some things that sins that come to mind in which you're, it's worthy of death, like deserving capital punishment as per our legal system? Thoughts? Murder. Murder, beautiful. Abby, life for life, the law of Lex Talionis, which says eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You know, if somebody murders, life shall be required of him. What about some other sins? How about if you lie, if you get angry, if you call someone a fool? Are you deserving death? As per our legal system, lie, lies don't deserve death. Maybe imprisonment if there was perjury. Calling someone a fool, you can get away with it. But in God's eyes, none of that is actually distinguished. Christ himself said, if you call a, a brother a, a fool, a raka, you are guilty of hellfire. Now, there is a sin that is unforgivable and worthy of death, we read in the scripture, and the sin that we know of and we expanded in the past is blasphemy. The Bible talks about blasphemy that shall be not for, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit as a sin that shall not be forgiven. Him in Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 to 32 actually establishes that all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven, forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world neither in the world to come. The twofold view of blasphemy is to ascribe unholiness to God who is holy, which is what the Pharisees had done. And contextually, Jesus is referring to them as the sin, as the speaking against the holiness of the Holy Spirit of God, that is the spirit of Christ himself. So ascribing unholiness to God. And then on the extrapolation aspect of that is when we look at it is in rejection of the conviction of the Holy Spirit who is given to teach and guide us in all truth and the truth that shall set you free, which is Jesus Christ, as we read, he will, the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, which is what he will do when he comes, as we read that, as, uh, the words of Christ in John chapter 16, verse 8 to 11. And upon the revelation of Jesus Christ, the truth and the truth who can make us free, 
the only one who can set us free, the sin of continued unbelief in the Son of God renders that person blasphemous because they have now rejected the voice of the Holy Spirit and they have actually that and, and hence is deserving of death or is unforgivable. No other means to salvation but by Christ. All have sinned and the wages of sin is death. So who is worthy of sin? It's the sinner, not the sinless. Now, let me read from Matthew chapter 26, some very interesting text. Now, the chief priest and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. A, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. Amazing how even a false witness could not find any reason why Jesus should be put to death. He was not worthy of death. At that time, at the last came two false witnesses. There should be two witnesses for the son to be judged, the rebellious son to be judged. Two false witnesses came for the righteous son to be judged and said, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, answer thou nothing? What is it which these witness have against thee? But Jesus held his peace. Like a lamb that went before the shearer without speaking a single word, he stood there. Isaiah chapter 53. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure you, I command you, I demand by the living God that you tell us whether you be the Christ, the Son of God. A very crucial question that was asked 2000, year, 2000 plus years ago, and it is not meant to be rhetoric. It's a question that even today rings true, and you and I have to answer that question today. For today is the day of salvation if you're not in the, in the, in the family of God. That you should ask that question, and the question is asked of you. What do you say? Is Jesus the Christ, the Son of God? What is your answer? Now hear Jesus' response. Jesus saith unto him, you have said, Nevertheless, I, said unto, I say unto you, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of, the, of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Jesus refers to himself as a Son of Man, not a Son of God, as he was asked to. Son of Man here is actually the title of a messianic king, the king that would come as, we, as was prophesied in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. Then the high priest rose and he rent his clothes. Another law that was broken, a high priest's robe shall never be rent, is what we learned in Leviticus. And he rent his clothes. He broke the law right there to break the lawgiver, saying, he has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witness? Behold, now you have heard his blasphemy. And then he asked, what think you? And they answered and they said, he is guilty. In other words, worthy of death. The chief priest accused Jesus, or the high priest accused Jesus of being blasphemous. What do you think? Was the chief priest correct? Think about it. Was the chief priest correct? Blasphemy is to ascribe that which is holy to be unholy. Technically, the high priest was not incorrect. Jesus, who is holy, was ascribed to be unholy. Not because he was unholy, but for our sakes, the rebellious, stubborn, unholy people Jesus was made unholy or sin, which aligns with 2 Corinthians 5, 20, 21. He who knew no sin was made sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. 1 John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 5 says, and you know that he was manifested, meaning God in spirit, who's holy of holy, Christ was incarnated to take away our unholiness, our sin, and in him is, is no sin. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 8 says, who with the very nature of God to declared, thought that it was to be robbery with God, made himself of no reputation and humbled himself to, the, to become in the likeness of man, in the imago homo, so that he would be then becoming obedient unto death that will put away evil. Herein, because Jesus becomes the very personification of sin, he becomes worthy of death for our sake and they hung him on the cross. Which takes me to my next point, or the last point over here. If we read Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, the last verse here, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. 
and that so that the land for he that is hanged is because of the of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God gives unto you. He should be buried before sundown. The condition is that if a man is displayed as a public spectacle, then the person cannot remain on the tree when it becomes dark, but must be buried. We actually see this in Joshua chapter 8 and Joshua chapter 10. I'll do that as, give that as homework, where he actually buries, he, he hangs the king of Ai. And then before evening, he tells, he commands that he should be brought down and he should be put into a tomb. And they gathered heaps of stones around, over that king. In Joshua chapter 10, we see five Amorite kings that came against the people of God. Joshua kills them. He hangs them on a tree again in the path before the evening, before the sun goes down. He tells that they bring them down and cast them into the cave where they had been hidden and they laid great stones in the cave's mouth. Burial today, we often think of like being put six foot under in the earth, in the Adam but burial contextually there was recorded as being placed behind stones. Jesus was buried in a tomb. He was killed, though not worthy of death as God, but as the God man, he became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. And interestingly, you know, that was the time when he had a place to lay his head. Ironic but still incomplete and in control of God. And we actually read that in Matthew chapter 27, verse 57 to 60, with Joseph of Arimathea. It says, crave the body of, of Jesus. Beautiful words. He went to buy Pilate and he begged and he craved the body of Jesus so that this Deuteronomic law could be met. And Jesus was buried in a tomb and they rolled a stone around over him. Why? So that the land is not defiled. The reason is given as to why someone should be buried. The land is not defiled, meaning that the person is raised off the land, lest that person's death defile the land. Ironically, land was defiled and cursed the day man willfully, stubbornly, in his own ways, rebelled against God in the garden by eating from the tree that was forbidden by God. So man's sin brought death and a curse on the land. Cursed is the ground for man's sake. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. So someone who is hung on a tree is like heaven has rejected that person and that earth has rejected that person. Someone was completely abandoned and forsaken. Jesus was forsaken by God. That's why he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew chapter 27, verse 14, for our sake. Jesus was rejected by men of the earth. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3. For the sake of man, God forsook God which led Jesus to cry out, why did you forsake me? He hung between heaven and earth. And he had to be buried so that the land will not be defiled. He lifted the curse of the land when he hung between heaven and earth. And that's what brings me to my next point of it being that he was accursed of God. He was accursed of God. The one who was judged by men but are cursed of God, not cursed by God, but becomes the curse of God. In fact, Jesus is not the one who is accursed of God. He is the accursed God so that sons of men, daughters of men will not be cursed of God. Galatians chapter 3 verse 10 to 14 says that as for as many as so the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone that continues not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident that the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ Verse 13, Galatians 3.13, has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Why? So that the blessing of Abraham, that all who believe in Jesus will become a child of Abraham, a child of faith, might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Jesus was cursed. So you and I can be blessed. And Ephesians chapter 1 verse 2 to 14 establishes that we have been blessed in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And that we would have the inheritance of a promised son. Not the rebellious son because we are accepted by God as being accepted in the beloved. Jesus, the righteous son of God, hung on the tree being made a curse for us. The rebellious sons who rightfully deserve death. Jesus is the man who is approved of God. He hung between heaven and earth to lift the curse and the defilement of the ground. And only in him can you receive the inheritance of eternal life in the very presence of God. 
Jesus was not just the accursed of God. He was a cursed God so that you and I would be blessed. Question, don't, uh, don't ignore this question. Are you blessed? In other words, do you believe in the Lord Jesus? And are you going to, or are you going to remain in your stubbornness and rebellion against God? Today is your day of salvation. In summary, and then we'll open it up for a time of discussion, a stubborn and rebellious son who does not listen to his father or mother or hearken to them, even after chastisement, must be taken hold of and brought to the elders at the gate of the city and upon the witness of his father and mother as being a glutton and a drunkard, a prodigal, a prodigal lifestyle, is to be stoned by the men of the city to death. Death of the rebellious son will put the evil away among from, away from among them. If a person has committed a sin worthy of death and is hung on a tree, that person must be buried before sundown so that the land that is promised inheritance of the people is not defiled. For the one who hangs on the tree is accursed of God. Jesus, the righteous son of God, upon witness of God against rebellious mankind was brought to the high priest and judged to be put to death for your sake and for my sake. Jesus, sinless and thus not worthy of death, willingly became the curse of God to lift the curse of the land that was cursed, defiled, and by his death and burial made it possible for all who believe in him to have promised inheritance of eternal life, it escape from eternal separation from God, escape from death, to be in the very presence of God that is to be blessed in heavenly places. Time to reflect. Are you blessed in heavenly places, redeemed from the curse of the law? In other words, have you believed in the Lord Jesus? Jesus was cursed for your sake so that you could be blessed of God. He was rejected by men and accursed of God so you could be accepted. If you've not accepted Jesus, this is your time. Don't wait a moment no longer. For, tomorrow, for the next moment, your breath may be taken away. If you are a believer, in, is your life one in obedience to the voice of God, hearing and heeding to his commands? Or is it stubborn that I'll be backsliding and rebellious against the voice of God through his word and by his spirit that he's spoken to us of his son. I'm going to stop and open it up for a time of discussion, comments, questions, observations, and uh, you know, feedback. All right, any thoughts? Looks like everybody's so quiet today, Manu. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> no, it's a heavy subject, right? Thank you, um, you know, for um, bringing all the details. Sometimes we read through it and we keep moving on. Um, to think that disobedience is worthy of death, you know, if you combine yeah. all the things that we put together, yeah. uh, that's what that is, and. You know, we generally talk about sin of omission, sin of commission, and uh, even disobedience in our thought um, is something that God cares about. You know, just recently uh, uh, over the weekend, I was having a conversation with the children, um, you know, about uh, which is so prevalent now of choices that young people make right. and all the words that people use. And this is so much even among um, Christians now, right? It's my choice whom I choose to love. Those right. are all words that get thrown out so flippantly. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the context in which I was having the conversation with the children was how do you respond to that? You yeah. know, they're 20 and 24. And if in their circle, people who claim to be Christians say these phrases and words because that's what they're hearing in culture. Right. Um, and so we're, we're talking about that. There is no, you know, degree of sin. Right. God looks at all of it same. Um, yeah. And yes, you know, thank God for Jesus uh, that we are covered in his righteousness. Yeah. But our personal accountability is still there. We can't, you know, abuse God's grace and right. live whichever way we want, interpreting, you know, the word. So anyway, this all kind of came back right. as uh, it's, it, you know, it's it's good. The the things that I was sharing with Hannah and Rachel were to ground it in God's word. What right. verses can we say? Because we still want to love this brother and sister and bring them right. back to Christ. It's yep. not about winning an argument but yep. winning people's hearts for Christ. So, you know, what are those verses we can use? And we were looking through some scripture 
and this was not on my list. <laughs> and so this is a good thing, right? I mean, yeah. um, again, thank you. Yeah. And I think yeah. maybe everybody is so maybe everybody is so quiet because this is heavy. It applies to each of us, and yeah. uh, we sometimes apply it to others, and easily so. But it's it's yeah. it's for us as well. Yeah, two, two points uh, to that, what you said, there is no degree of sin in God's eyes, all sin is sin. So that's why the wages of sin is death. Yep. And then the second point to that is, uh, you mentioned about not abusing the grace of God in Romans chapter six, he's very clear and says, what then shall I say, shall we continue to live in sin, yep. meaning you no, know, continue to backslide and be rebellious is essentially what that would translate to in the context of today's study. And he says, me in in in, 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 um, in uh, Greek, that would render as, May it never be so, or God forbid, forbid is essentially yeah. what it comes that we continue to live that lifestyle. So. Brother Mano, for that, uh, for me, two things, uh, uh, the, the words stubborn and rebellious uh, come to mind is when we are like that stubborn and rebellious. It's mm -hmm. mainly, uh, I think of it, I always tell Abigail, um, you know, sometimes they, children get upset when we correct and discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I say we are the only two people as parents who will correct you and discipline you yep. uh, until you, you know, uh, come to a stage where you can uh, decide for yourself. But we often fail to remember when we become adults, we hardly have anybody to correct us and discipline us, except it's the word of God yep. for us. When we read the word of God and the Holy Spirit, when it convicts us. Right. Uh, uh, when he convicts he can, us to yeah. do something wrong yeah. but we are still often stubborn and rebellious to that correction yeah. um, I mean in, in our family prayer many times when I pray I feel I, I pray that we don't become calloused in our heart mm -hmm. to the word of God yeah. by not heeding the discipline yeah. uh, I mean, God corrects us only through his word and, and as adults we we feel oh nobody can correct us right so uh thank you for that reminder because uh, that's what god god out of his love wants to discipline and correct absolutely us. beautiful and then present com present company included i'm in the same situation as you are where rejecting or not hearkening to the voice of god revealed to the word in thought word deed life um so we're all in the thing pray for the holy spirit to give us the strength to continue to be in his word and to to be the to reflect the character of Christ. Anyone else have any thoughts? Okay, we have about two minutes. So thank you again, uh, Sister Suja and Sister Dorothy for your sharing. Um, if you have any questions, comments, feel free to write, ask, uh, and we'll address those. We have about a minute to go before service. So if one of you could kindly lead us in a word of prayer, I'd ask you to lead us in a word of prayer and we can close. Yeah, I can, I can do that. Now. Yeah, good chance. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time. Thank you for giving each one of us this opportunity to come and listen from your word. And Lord, your word is inerrant. Um, we just thank you, Lord, for uh, Brother Mano as well, who's been able to uh, go through this with so much of detail and come and share this with us. Uh, it, this is a heavy topic, Lord, but we pray that this will reside in our hearts and minds and... Uh, transform us to be more like your son Jesus Christ and appreciate the price that he paid for us on that tree where he took the curse upon himself and he became the curse for us. Uh, help us to remember that through this day, through the next upcoming weeks and help us to be filled with gratitude, Lord, for the, gra for the sacrifice uh, that has uh, purchased our eternal life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. God bless you. I will see you in church a couple of minutes from now. So God, God bless you. Thank you, Mano. Thanks, Mano. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you, Mano. Thank you, Mano.